There we go. Right. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, James has come today to talk to us about user experience in design. Um, and I will hand over to him. Thanks very much. Um, well, I've got a well, I've got a series of slides and a bit of a talk to go through. I wasn't really sure like what sort of people would be coming along in the different like levels of, I suppose, existing knowledge. So if I am telling you things you already know. I apologize. Um, but if there are any, uh, I'll try to give like some examples or some sort of insights from things that we've had that are actually normally like some sort of bad examples. So I'm trying not to, uh, you know, just give the, the glowing, the glowing examples, if you like. So if there are any questions throughout, feel free to use the chat um, and just ping them in there and interrupt me and I'll just see how that goes. But um, I'm going to share my screen and then I'll take you through so first of all make sure that you can see the presentation yeah we've got that thanks james great um can i get this okay um so jenny just a brief introduction about myself um i'm james hansen i'm the founder and uh Director at Lily's Studio. Um, I'm designer by trade um, and have worked in everything from, well, start off in branding, do website design, and then more UX um, and uh, UI design as well uh, over the last sort of seven or eight years. Um, more specifically, especially since starting uh, Lily's Studio, as that was the area we want to go into. Um, so for this, talk with the sort of uh, theme of the conference being around uh, people wanted to kind of give some insights or I suppose our insights we've taken from things that we've learned along the way around kind of the way I suppose user experience design uh, leverages people not just from the process but within like teams um, so that's not a good start I think. There we go. Uh, so final bit on us, I suppose, like specifically Lay's studio. Um, so this is actually part and bomb of the design I was just saying there uh, before we started this call for our new uh, website, which only exists in our design files and has been sitting there for the last three and a bit months whilst we wait for some time to build it ourselves, but uh, we'll get around to that, I'm sure, by next year. The whole part of layers and one of the reasons why I called the business layers was um, the process of actually design itself. Like there's lots of layers to that process um, and the same goes for specifically UX design, um, but also the approach that I wanted to instill within the team and the culture around bringing together different people, different expertise um, from the very beginning of a project to get those different perspectives, look at problems from a different lens. Um, and because realistically, we think that that's the best way to come up with the most innovative solutions or the most effective, like innovative is a word that gets thrown around a lot, but just like the most effective solutions based on the resources, the time, the budget, the, you know, the general goals, like by combining those different skill sets as early as possible, then you'll come up with the most a suitable outcome in our perspective. Uh, so UX design. Um, so I took, you know, the meanings here uh, from usability.gov on specifically what does user experience mean? So focusing on having a deep understanding of the users, what they need, what they value, their abilities, and also their limitations. Um, it also takes into account uh, the business goals and objectives of the group managing the project. So I've added in there that it must take into account the business goals and objectives because I think that's something that when we go to a lot of sort of talks or, you know, uh, sort of inspiring talks or uh, experiential talks around user experience design, there's best practices, there's um, the right way to do something and the wrong way to do something. But often I think people can get too focused on you know, why are you doing the design a certain way and doing that process a certain way 
and it gets slowly and slowly and slowly more and more removed from the actual business goals or more importantly, the business constraints, because as it mentions there, like limitations is, you know, it, it's a huge factor from a commercial point of view in anything that we're trying to do. So the design part of that is the solution that caters to the user's needs, values, utilizes their abilities and works towards the business goals, despite any and all known limitations. And obviously, the better you do the initial part of that process within the user experience uh, design in your UX research, the more limitations you'll become aware of or user uh, abilities that can often become limitations. Otherwise, they are unknown and sometimes these things crop up. Um, so common problems. So no matter what the project, uh, there's always the task of understanding the key points from a user's perspective. So, you know, you've got, as I said, their needs and values and abilities and limitations, but the common problems that you would find, I suppose, from, you know, before UX became so sort of well-respected as an approach to design would be taking your own uh, opinions and by that, not just the sort of you personally, but the royal we within a team, like what we believe the needs to be, what we think the values are, um, and what we believe the abilities and limitations are of either the user or um, the actual project itself within you know what capabilities are within any given team. Uh, so we want to try and avoid those sort of common common problems. So looking at it from the people approach side of things, so kind of what is it about people that you can leverage within UX design? Um, and before I kind of get into getting outside of what you have internally, because I don't know, you know, if you look at this from the perspective of you and your company or uh, a, a problem for a member of your consult consultant for a client or a company who've got their own team and you're trying to help them work out the best way to do it. Like the first thing you should, I think, always do is kind of look internally at what you what you've currently got and how you can maximize that um, to start off with. So uh, leaning on expertise. So as I mentioned with the approach to starting layers, if you like, um, was I'd had some negative experiences of working in teams where certain people get given you know, like a lead based on their expertise. So they or their skill set, let's say that's a better term. Uh, and because they have a certain skill set, well, then they should make, you know, like all of the decisions. Um, now, obviously, you've got to have sort of managerial structure, but it is, you know, the, the what's the word? Like the, the machine is worth more than the sum of all its parts. So by taking different people with different, uh, skill sets and use, utilizing them in a team, you will get to see things from different people's perspectives um, based on their knowledge base. So we've got you know different types of designers actually, but we've got designers here, um, project managers, um, business and people focused account positions, uh, developers and social and digital marketing. Actually, internally there, that's iron the bottom. Um, but when we start a project whilst someone in the minute, usually myself, will have taken the brief from a client or a group of you know, clients. Um, we bring that back in, uh, it gets shared amongst the team, and then we kind of tear apart from everybody else's perspective, Google Docs and stuff like that's a great way to throw a load of different comments into a, um, into a document without someone interrupting someone else, without somebody, um, having a different opinion and then effectively silencing that other person, you know, it, it's a good way to actually get lots of different viewpoints on a set of goals, some sort of brief as long as you laid that out and then come back to the table together to go back through what's been said and make amends, make suggestions, go back to a client with questions. Uh, include as much diversity as possible. Um, now, I, I think we've got quite a, you know, that's, we've got a small -ish team there, there's like eight of us, but we've got some good diversity there. We've got some people from different um, parts of the world and they've got different backgrounds. Daniel was even brought up in Sunderland and he has integrated really well with the team. So that in itself shows, you know, you can you can work with just about anyone. Um, but uh, the dog is useless. He has got no skills um, at all. But 
with regards to the diversity in the background i've got a little bit more on that from like how that helps with seeing problems from a different way and also helping other people who are struggling with a specific uh, situation to deal with it in a different manner but it certainly helps with the team's um, ability to communicate i think we all have to get better at communication and having different backgrounds in a really good team i think has helped us get much better at that um and being aware of like your gaps like so we're not we're not a full service industry, uh, agency we don't pretend to be we can't do everything um so you know whether it's working with um app uh, native app builders like the guys at neighbor labs have been friends with dylan now uh, jimmy bradley and james Rutherford. they're also developers with different sort of specialist skill sets that we bring in from time to time and these are just some examples like we're not you know we we make clients aware that we're doing that as well and we'll try and get uh lean on their expertise and their experience if we don't have that there we've got copywriters like sean uh, technical seo um guys like adam um work within the past and we bring that in and I think in the past where I've, I've worked different places, sometimes even where they do that, it's done in a really secretive way to try and, you know, not let people know that this skill set isn't within their business. But even that can cause sort of problems with regards to kind of moving things forward. Because if we're talking about that communication, you really want people to be able to have direct communication with clients, with users, and it's difficult to do that if they're, um, hidden behind some sort of like veil. Um, so I think that's important. That's something uh, people can think about. Um, why this can go wrong. So this is looking at this from the perspective of if we're just using our team, even though or, or our team plus the client's internal team, um, or even if you're an in-house company and you've got this these skill sets, you will find that sometimes you know you be really confident that you're looking at this and you can see everything from the perspective of the user or the client um and really even though you're looking at the same thing you're just looking at it from two completely different angles and you have this what's the word like um inability to see things the way that a, a real user does like you can't possibly see everything that they're doing um so we would obviously prefer to be able to look at things from the user's perspective. I forgot I had this slide in. So uh, before we do that, as an example of like this sort of um, overconfidence that the view that you have internally is that that your user has. We were brought in um, uh, late last year. Uh, we were on about a six month project with. Uh, quite a big um finance provider that we're not allowed to talk about but um they internally have already chopped their teams up large teams into these very specific products and these are really important and we were brought in alongside some ux researchers um and other ux designers to work on the full client uh, customer experience journey uh, and really design that and try and help people get past all these roadblocks that they'd identified. And the problem was that this company had already made decisions that, you know, their products were chopped up in this way. So we just had to look at the journeys for those different products. And we didn't need to talk from one product team, didn't need to talk to the other product team. Um, and we really highlighted quite early on, to be fair, that we didn't, we didn't think this was the right approach, but it took them a really long time going through a really, like quite a lot of user testing to start to see that what we suggest at the beginning was right that actually their users don't really care about their product teams and quite a large percentage of them really don't even know what a sip is like i didn't know what a sip was when we started the project so the idea that i had to make that decision really early on was was one of the key reasons why people were dropping out in their journeys why people weren't even getting into the right journey for a pension transfer for instance just because industry language and technical speak just isn't part of that user's ability set. So they were really alienating them from the beginning. Um, uh, I'd like to say there was a good example of kind of how we fixed that, but basically they just kind of waited until they realized and spent six months doing it the way they wanted that that way wasn't going to work and now they've started again. 
Um, but it is important to try and kind of highlight those things as best as you can. And sometimes you, I guess you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be able to do um, a good enough job to prevent something bad from happening, but it, you've always got to try and put that point across. Um, so it, getting away from just, you know, your team. So obviously working with your users is ideal. Um, I do think uh, a lot of times when we talk to sort of small clients as well, there's always the almost almost more more nerve, nervousness in the small clients talking with their customers and client bases that they're going to, I don't know, say something that will upset customers or present the, this really, um, you know, valuable set of people that they sell to that they maybe don't know everything or that they look perhaps like they don't know what they're doing. Whereas when they're bigger companies and, you know, they've got thousands of customers, they're not really bothered about talking to like one or two, fine if we can get some insights, that's great. They're not really looking at it from that perspective. So I think um, interviewing them is really important uh, and specifically interviewing them. So, you know, we've got a lot of customers, uh, a lot of our clients that are smaller clients will be happy to send out a survey or something that they feel is anonymous or something that's less intrusive. But the feedback that you get from that, um, not to go into like the research side of it, but there is a lot that you can read upon, you know, like the the tendency to instead give in a fair response to give like a five out of 10 instead of a two, because you were like, you know what I mean? Like those type of things that it's difficult to pick up on genuine data in surveys and things like that. So if you can have human conversations with someone, I think that works a lot better. The Mom Test is a great book if you would like to uh, read a little bit more on that and techniques are doing that. And um, wherever possible, observe them. So I know it's like, might sound obvious, but not all users even know what the issues that they have are, where they come from, what they stem from, um, why is that they're frustrated with your product. But if you actually observe what they're doing, then you'll start to notice things. Um, and, you know, good designers, uh, good UX researchers um, and user testers will get better and better at that spotting things that, you know, the users doesn't notice uh, that they're doing or, you know, just watching someone interact with your product can be quite painful sometimes if you're just like, I can't believe that they didn't see all these fantastic things that we spent ages doing um, in that path. Uh, there's loads of those examples online. It's quite a funny one where at the end of the day, sometimes users are just trying to get from A to B as quickly as possible. So it's a good thing to actually observe them. Um, when you're looking at something like, because this kind of came about, I suppose like in that previous example that I was talking about, um, it becomes really tempting to focus on a specific problem because you've decided that that problem at that point in the journey is the, is where all of the issues lie. But if you don't look at the whole journey, then you might miss that it lies there because of point A or because it, you know, it, it you can make something similar in the middle of the journey, but if you do, it's going to cause problems further down the line. Um, and we've had uh, a couple of different examples of that as well. But one with regards to um, uh, it was uh, it's a leasing company for short term car leasing, and they're trying to automate the process that you go through when you do that. Um, I think we're on to like version eight of that whole journey, just because of uh, that that same problem of assuming that we can move this issue further down the line. And sometimes it makes it worse. So things around a bit boring, but around things like credit checks and stuff like that, where do you get more of the information? And sometimes you can't know for sure without running these tests, doing a trial for a while, finding out how that affected it and then improving it incrementally. But we certainly couldn't do what we've done with those guys if we just decided that uh, taking the large amount of information for the credit check that they want to do uh, has to happen at the beginning or it, or it has to happen at the end. And we just decided it that way. We wouldn't have been able to get them. We, they are um, doing exponentially better. Um, they weren't doing very well at the beginning of mine, so it, it wasn't that hard. But um, it, it, it takes a process sometimes. But it, as I say, look at the whole journey. Try not to get tricked into focusing on one little point as if it isn't um, connected to the rest of it. Uh, so how those things can still go wrong? Uh, so don't show them, you know, if you've got to show them how it works during user testing, 
probably doesn't. And there's also uh, the problem where you know, some users are outliers. So you can do use testing sometimes and the user loves it and they blast through that and it's fantastic. And you think you've done such a good job, but they could be a much more experienced user or you know, it's good to ask what their, their jobs are. They might be someone who works a lot in sort of tech or in that industry or has a knowledge base around finance. And um, I think that was one of the problems with the uh, SIP stuff that I was talking about was some of the key people that were interested in doing the user testing from their user base were actually people who spent a lot of time in their looking at their finances, doing investments. So it took them a long time to appreciate that the wider group of uh, their users actually didn't have a clue what was going on. Um, with regards to, um, oh, so sorry, so, this, so the don't show them thing. So as a, um, a bit of a spin out point for this. So during that actual same project, uh, we observed from the people we were working with who had the user researchers that there started to be a lot of pushback from an internal team where they were watching people struggle with their project, sorry, their product. And they were getting really annoyed with the user testers that they didn't show them how to use it properly. Um, and you know, this sort of pushback caused a lot of friction where I think actually what was missing in that scenario was someone who could have had a, you know, a human conversation with the actual internal team and the internal stakeholders to let them know um, that this was probably gonna happen and explain to them that the reasons why we wouldn't be getting involved or the reasons why we wouldn't intervene and help users do it properly was because it was, you know, it was gonna defy the whole point. But in the end, what actually happened was I think it, it, it caused a lot of friction because they felt like um, the finger was being pointed at them for what they had already done. Um, and when you are doing testing and it is going well, so this is a project we've been doing this year. Um, it's on a, it, it's not finance related, it's actually a business uh, tool. Um, we did a lot of testing, got loads of great feedback, project the product, moved in all the right directions. And then right at the end, it was shown to an internal team. And the example given here is this is some of the data uh, representations that users were shown during the testing. And their internal team is a lot of data science, uh, really talented uh, developers. And some of the feedback that was is being implemented at the minute, and they'll see how it goes, is the change in some of the charts because these are better, because these show way more information, which this product is actually aimed at uh, smaller businesses and people who need more assistance in understanding what's happening in their business. So like right at the end, they're starting to change, in our opinion, things that are really key to work and being simple and making it, in our opinion, way more complicated. It's really difficult to have that conversation with a group of people who don't get to that. We think that this is you know, more complicated. I don't think it's an issue in a longer term because what we've done with this one is effectively we implemented the ability to set what type of chart that you like. So those charts are in there, but it's a good example of kind of some like bias creeping back in, like right at the end, like, you know, we've got this uh, expertise and we know that in some cases, these charts are better because it's like, this has been looked at from the point of view of like uh, master degree level data analyst people, not, um, you know, solo entrepreneur business people who are starting out for themselves. So it it's important to kind of remind yourself, I suppose, whilst you're going through that sort of thing. Um, so don't ignore the business goals. Um, everything can't happen at once. Uh, and this gets a little bit, um, I suppose, controversial from a UX design point of view in that I think it's really important to not have a, uh, like a rose tinted glasses approach to UX design. Now we will come up with the best possible thing that we can do. We look at your current product, we'll pull up all of the different bits that don't meet certain standards or could be improved. And then all of those things need to be done before it, it is effectively improved enough for it to be pushed. Um, and 
a good example of that was a bit of panic that uh, we'd kind of heard about from a company that it's we're not actually working with them, but we're just kind of consulting with them at this stage. Uh, where the the software is actually um, accountancy sort of payroll software, and they've done a lot of work to improve their accessibility. And it's you know, in comparison to where it was two or three years ago, it's like streets ahead of where it was. But uh, there are still things that mean it doesn't pass uh, like the AAA standards around things like screen readers. Um, and whilst you know this is a as I say bit controversial but as a good example th there's way more things they need to push up their list of priorities from a business sense point of view because the percentage of users that they have at the minute that use screen readers is technically zero so to actually spend a lot of time and fix that first um doesn't make business sense and for the be able to keep function at the end of the day they need to make everyone needs to make sure that they're addressing the needs of the business um, as well as their users, they obviously go hand in hand. But I think sometimes we can get sidetracked on like what is the, the the AAA standard for absolutely everything we can test for. It's what is the most important thing for your current user base and what will help you get to the business goals in the sort of most sensible step-by-step -step approach. You don't need to kind of down tools and start updating alt text for SVG icons or whatever it was, I think that they were, that was causing them a the problem. Um, and sort of lastly is that within the sort of people approach side of things, it's not just um, diversity of, I guess, um, experience and skill set, like I was mentioning before and background. There's also um, like different traits that people have and the way that they approach problems it's a really good way to come up with new solutions or see see solutions to problems that you wouldn't have spotted before uh, and i'm just using our team again as an example so i'm not getting in trouble for uh char mischaracterizing anybody i don't really know but um i find it really interesting working with our team and it's been uh, or just any team really but a team of people closely where you get a learn different things about them um we have a project manager whose background isn't in what was what he said in his interview tech although he did help uh the aviva uh the or Reva, the uh, travel company like do the larger sort of digitization of their buses and things like that and it's taken that someone with those sort of uh organizational skills and the sort of systems and process mindset and pairing them with someone who's more data analyzed or uh, research uh, with Lorena um, minded and getting the different views um, and then also making sure that we have within our team or anyone has within their team someone who is good with people and communication so I've got there like Daniel's really empathetic towards other people's feelings so <laughs> when we have those sort of, I think that example I gave earlier where we have observed, you know, a bit of friction there where a team of people felt like they were a, a, a genuinely honest process of just user testing something was a way of sort of pointing out things that they perhaps done incorrectly. I think that sort of uh, trait would have been really useful in that situation to actually um, mitigate, mitigate that early on because I think that was lacking in that sense. But at the same time, uh, it is important to have someone who can almost get past someone else's sort of emotional response to something that they've done, cut through that and look at it from a really sort of uh, a, a user centric point of view, as in just, you know, what are the needs and values of the users, like not really being too focused on the design or whether or not they think it looks pretty or something like that. Um, and combining those is what I think has worked well for us and I would recommend that people you know try their best to look at um even when hiring um from our perspective like you know there are your skill sets but is there is like is there more you can bring to the table from your personality your attitude the way that you approach problems um and you know as long as you've got the drive to to improve your skill set that'll happen um, anyways uh on that topic 
nothing really related to design, but if you haven't watched uh, The Last Dance, it is a really good series on Netflix, which shows all the different sort of uh, things that go into a sort of a successful team at the highest standard in this sport. And I mean, it is, there is different sort of diversity within that as well, but also the sort of mindsets and the uh, willingness to learn how to work as a team. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic documentary. Um, last one on just a few different um, resources. So obviously there's a heuristic approach and you don't have, like, you, you may not always have the time to use a test in and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, uh, the energygroup.com, the Nelson, Nelson Group, uh, in your org is a really good resource. I love the designbetter.co website for little, um, they, they kind of chug things and design thinking sort of tools to sort of learning. And uh, Interaction Design Org is um, really good places to go and check out for resources if you're ever um, looking for stuff before you start a project or just to kind of find out new things. Um, so from the top point of view, that's, that's it from my perspective. Uh, there's um, some contact details for me here. The next thing I was going to do is I've got a Figma board I was going to share in if people want to put questions in there because I don't think I've seen anything on the chat, but um, I can't really see it on the way I've got my screen set up. I haven't missed any questions, have I, Susie? No, there's nothing in the chat at the moment, but I don't know if anybody has some um, has anything now. <clears throat> I don't have any questions. I was generally just being nosy to see what James had to say this afternoon. <laughs> and, and my lunch has just been... Kindly delivered. Um, no, I, mate, I thought I was really good. Um, massively interesting, and I'd be really keen, if possible, to um, get the recording of it to show the rest of our team, if that would be possible. Yeah, well, we're going to be putting them all up. Northumbria University is hosting them all um, on their website. So um, as this has been recorded, we'll get that sent across to them, and they'll be um, they'll be putting on their website. I wish yeah. I turned the fan on. Seen how red my face has gone. Seen how red my face is now. You know. Might be just the light. <laughs> Um, I had a question if nobody else did at this point. Just um, just in terms of, I guess, user experience design mm -hmm. and what that can be applied to. I guess, you know, here you, you've talked a lot about, I guess, what I imagine to be quite complex processes and things that your users are interacting with. But can the same principle sort of be applied to anything, you know, like customer journeys in terms of, yeah. You know, onboarding clients, things like that. Is it is it something? Is, do the same principles apply, or is it you know a slightly different way of doing it? Yeah, I think it's hundred percent the same principles apply no matter no matter what you're doing. I I actually think that a lot of the processes that are now championed by uh, UX design are just slightly rebranded processes for like what was um, uh, branding and marketing in the past. It's the more you can understand about you your user the person at the end of the day that is going to interact whatever that interaction is whether that's you know an app or um the process of purchasing something um like what is their experience like then you're in a better position to improve that alter that um sometimes even just understand why they're doing it in the first place because you know like I think a lot of time we look at UX, UX design and think that the reason why it was started is because there was like a problem in the first place. But often some people, you know, th there's not necessarily a problem. What they want to do is understand why they use it so much so that then they could kind of hone in on the thing that has value and magnify that. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be um, a big thing. It can be just your website. It can be... Uh, I'm trying to think of like, like even really simply when, so with websites, we like to try and make sure that there's some sort of function in anything that we do. And even if that is just connecting uh, something as simple as an inquiry form in your CRM, for instance. Um, but like we've got, I think, I don't know, I think I've taught mine off, but we've got like the ability to things like book and, um, you know, those things like Calendly and stuff like that, where you can book, you know, book your sort of calendar. Uh, we had that in a, in, a, in a system we had for a while and um, we had people going through it and then not filling, not booking in with myself or Paula. Um, and I'm still not sure if this is just the people that we questioned, but uh, 
we did we got, you get things like feedback like well it felt a bit cheeky that i was supposed to, i was supposed to just uh work on a time that suited you was like a feedback we got of two people and it was like that was not the purpose of the calendar it was supposed to show all of the time that you know that we were available but um that you know things like that like that was a really really trivial thing for us it was just something we kind of bothered to ask some people about and that was the feedback we got so i think it's it can go from literally the process of someone landing on your website and deciding whether or not to stay on it for more than 10 seconds or it can be something like a whole customer experience journey through applying for something filling out forms getting responses all that like it doesn't I don't think it uh, must have been sitting still. I uh, don't think it, um, it I don't think the, the, the principles and the processes uh, are only for one thing or another. I didn't really go into sort of specific sort of ways of doing user testing or gathering feedback or, you know, like the, the, there's loads of different ways of doing it. Um, and in truth, if you're trying to choose the one that's right for you, it, it, you're probably best, you know, doing a bit of uh, research on one of those websites and seeing, you know, like just searching for the, 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 the goal that you're trying to achieve. And then you'll get some good results on different ways of doing it, um, which will give you a good idea as to kind of how to approach it. Um, it works different for different use groups. Obviously, if you're trying to do for lots of people or a small group, or you can do things more personally. But I think um, just trying, just, the other thing is you can't really do it necessarily wrong if you don't implement anything. If you try something and you don't get good data from that or good feedback, you can try something else. But yeah, I'm not sure if that's his question very well. No, 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 it definitely does. I think that's the thing. So, you know, just thinking about how that that same process and methodology can kind of be applied to, to lots of different things that you're doing. Um, yeah, really interesting. Thank you. How can I, James, can I ask how much of your kind of process do you apply depending on the size of the project it's a good like, question you know what i mean like a lot of the stuff that you've gone through I, as i say I, I thought it was brilliant really interesting and we often have the discussion in our studio around like you know depend on that size of project how how deep can we dive into the research bit and the do you know what I mean how much of the the ideal process can we follow when yeah, simply the budget just isn't there to do yeah. it. It's a, it's a huge struggle, and um, it's not sitting over there. The runner, uh, is, it's is always pushing, you know, for us to do more. Um, and yeah. it's uh, like she started in house, um, and some of the experience that she's got has been invaluable to kind of twist and not twist and change in our perspectives on that sometimes, but um. There's, there's two things with budget. So there's like, um, if, if there's some budget there, what we would try and do is carve out a certain amount of time that we know is like hours for say like actual user testing. And so we need at least that amount of time to do whatever, like a group of five uh, user tests in a day and we want to do two sets. And we put that time and show the client it is like a time. And it is like a... a I don't know if this is what you get at, but there is a bit of like us having like justify, like this is time to be allocated to this because of this reason type of thing. Um, but what we've found over, certainly over the last year or two, is people are much more receptive to that because when I started, like no one, well, no one we were talking to wanted to pay for it. But what is harder, but what we found is much, it's been a relief that with the, the sort of bigger clients that have been lucky enough to do a bit of work with, uh, this year and then the last year is instead of having to put like a um what's the word like a like a like a waterfall like a line in the sand and say like we'll do this ux research and it will get us to exactly like this point so for instance that project with the the graphs um the work when we did push back on that there were some people in the team at the end who were like well why didn't we why haven't we already user tested all of the all of the graph types? And it was like, well, because we set this amount of time aside because there was a deadline. So like we've got to decide when does the research stop and we've got to decide when does user testing stop. And that was where we could get to in that time. And yeah. you know, in, in hindsight, 
yeah, we probably should have had time allocated to test every single graph type and find out what worked best. But realistically, even if they put budget into that, they didn't have time. They didn't have a deadline time for that. So um, thankfully, we've been able to kind of, I don't like the word woolly back on. It's like, we're going to do as much as we can within this time period. And, and we have to show value when we do it. But at least the clients are becoming more open to the idea that I can't tell you right now before we've done it what we will what we will have definitely achieved by the time that's finished. And I think that's helped because in the past, I think what's been almost impossible is like this that justification. So that justification of time without being able to say, well, at the end of it, we will have solved, you know, all of yeah. your problems, which is it's not really possible. We're just trying to say we'll nudge you as far forward as we can. Um, and I think reporting and having someone who's detail oriented the, the reports that Lorena puts together specifically after user testing, to, uh, if I'm honest, there's no chance I'd have sat down and wrote all that. Um, if I was doing it in the past, I would use pictures or diagrams or stat things to try and show things. Whereas I think that has helped us um, add the value in, in some sort of quantifiable thing from a client's perspective to say to their, you know, whoever's looking over their shoulder, we got all of this information out of it. So okay. that, that's kind of what we're trying to do. I think that answers a bit. But it, it, but it's different every project and um, um, it, it does depend on budget. Like it just depends on yeah. what, they've, what they've got. Cool, man. Thank you. Cheers, Paul. Are there any other questions? No. All right. Brilliant. Should we um should we wrap it up there then? Yeah. James? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy with that. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Um no as I say, the, the recording will be available um shortly um on the Northumbria website. Um and do watch out for for the other things that we've got coming up in the series because there's a really big range. Um, everything from supporting working parents to um rug, using rugby tactics in business and tech things in between nice all right cheers everyone so thank you everybody see you cheers. Cheers. Bye.